Hello, Hosanna. It's good to be connected with you again this way. Wow, this period of social distancing and quarantining sure has given new emphasis to the idea of being connected, doesn't it? <laughs> Hasn't it? For many of us right now, connected means having an internet service provider. I found this just this week, a report that surprised me. It says that of the 7.7 billion people on the earth, 4.54 billion are active internet users. That just blew me away. I didn't realize it was that many. Four and a half billion people are on the internet and maybe just precisely for such a time as this most of america is 90 percent of u.s residents are online online now it differs by age about 100 percent of adults under 30 are online only 73 percent of those over 65 but i bet you that number's getting higher every day because that's the best way we can stay connected with one another right now well, we are able to meet together like this. It's not quite the meeting, but we are able to be together like this because of the blessings of the internet. There are curses mm -hmm. of the internet too. There are detriments, but uh, we also know that connection means something more than merely having a broadband connection. Yeah. That's why we're doing this special series this month. We put aside what we had planned to do when this whole global thing came up in order to ponder stuff like what we noticed last Sunday, if you got a chance to uh, to listen to our message then. And last Sunday, we were saying that we are created for connection. Yeah. We long to love and to be loved. We long to connect and to belong. That's what we were created for. That's what God made us, for life-giving relationship with God and each other. We're never going to be fulfilled in this life without it. And the good news is that God is love. Not just that God does love. God is love. And so the God who is love created us in love and for love. And God has and always will love us. He will never love us any more or love us any less than what he has now because his love is full. And most of us know that already. I'm saying stuff and you're probably sitting there going, yep, mm -hmm, true. At least we know it in our heads. And we can agree and we can sing the songs. We can maybe even quote the Bible verses for God so loved the world. And, and at one level, we believe that. But knowing all about God doesn't mean having a personal relationship with him. With him. And you know that as well. You know, I can know everything that there is to know about Prince Harry. And it's easy to do that because there's so much stuff out there. I can know every detail of his life with Meghan Markle. I can be if I wanted to be, and I'm not, just wild about Harry. But I still wouldn't personally know him. And the question is, how many Christians do the same thing with God? How many of us know in our heads that God loves us, but don't really feel God's love? Don't really experience God personally in relationship? So if this were a connection with God is what we were made for, if this is what we most deeply long for, I mean, if we have a God who really wants to share, us to share love with him, then why is it that so often we actually don't feel the love of God? Well, Tony, I think the response to that question would be that, put plainly, most of us just don't trust love. We're afraid of vulnerability. We're afraid of intimacy. And on a deep level, it appears we're afraid of love itself. We've all been there, done that. We've put our hearts out there and been deeply wounded. Mm -hmm. As a result, most of us would just rather not feel that kind of pain again. Thank you very much. I mean, whether it happened to us as a child, a teen, an adult, or all of the above, we risked loving and we received hurtful, critical responses in return. We got back some messages that we were unacceptable as we are, just not good enough to be loved back. And so we say to ourselves, I don't ever wanna feel like that again. I'm gonna protect myself. I'm going to hold my deepest self safely inside of me and not trust anyone. I'm only gonna trust myself. Sometimes that's conscious, sometimes it's not. But in either case, so often the pain of vulnerably loving can trigger a fear of love itself. So rather than staying open to God and others and life and all that authentic love brings, including both pain and joy, both disappointment and satisfaction, rejection, and embrace uncertainty, yes, and confidence. 
instead of opening to all of that, the fullness of the abundant life in Christ. No, we settle for safety. We settle for what we can control or earn or deserve. We settle for what we can do in our own strength. We settle for surviving, not thriving. And we make do with the limited existence that fear allows us. And all the while, deep inside, the sense of dissatisfaction, the fear, anxiety, and the desire for the peace, rest, and acceptance that only love can give, all of that just continues to gnaw at us. And that's what happens in ordinary, everyday, normal life. So what happens when the world feels out of control? What happens when it feels like our lives are beyond our control and we're in moments of high stress as we're doing, as we are right now? It's what million, million, billions of people, including ourselves, are feeling right now. And, and one very common response is that we get afraid. I mean, really afraid. But what do we mean by that? What is fear anyway? Because this is not just a standard message that says <clears throat> that you shouldn't fear. We want to we unpack that a little bit. Is fear always a bad thing? It's one word that means some very different kind of experiences, and those mm -hmm. distinctions are necessary so we can pay attention to what's going on inside of us and to what God is wanting to do in us and for us. And so, so let, let's talk about different kinds of fear. First, there's what I'm calling rational fear. This is a mat necessary, mature, healthy response to mm -hmm. things that are real concerns. Yeah. This is not the kind of stuff that you want to not be afraid of. It's why we don't walk out in front of traffic. It's why we don't run with scissors, <laughs> as our first grade teachers told us. It's why we don't meet in large groups while there's a global pandemic going on. And if you feel any of that rational fear, good for you. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is good. This is healthy. Don't be afraid of that. Don't be ashamed of that. The question, of course, is what we do with that fear, but we'll, we'll get to that a bit later on. Mm -hmm. Well, we know, but there's also this, uh, what we might call an obsessive fear. And th this is the kind of stuff that might have roots in rational fear. It begins with something that is a, really a concern, but it goes beyond it. It becomes a fear that controls us, that tempts us to panic or, or to go dark. It traps us in worst case scenarios, keeps us up at night. Yeah. Maybe it's a phobia that keeps us from enjoying some of the, uh, some of the joys of life. Yeah. Now, there's no shame in that. We all have those. They're all, <laughs> you know, if a spider came across my screen right now, I would not be terribly happy. But, <laughs> but God does have something good to offer us if we have obsessive fears or when we have them. But if we're going to tap into what God has to offer us, that means we have to deal with the third kind of fear, which is our fear of God. And that's at the root of a lot of these other fears. Many of us have been taught to be afraid of God. And part of that came because early English translations of the Bible confused admonitions to stand in awe of God yeah. as commands to fear him. So you read the old King James, it was like, fear of the Lord. And people interpreted that in ways that that was not what that translation was trying to say. The original biblical text is very clear about this. God is love. Those who are living in love are living in God, and God lives through them. By living in love, love has been brought to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly, fearlessly, this is without fear of God, face the day of judgment. Yes. Because all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. Yeah. Love, God's love, this love never brings fear. For that kind of fear is always related to punishment. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment far from our hearts. And if this sounds good news to you, by the way, read the rest of it in 1 John chapter 4. Some really good news there. What's it saying? God has already loved us. Already. We don't need to earn it. We don't need to prove it. We don't need to buy it. And if we got into the verb tenses and everything there, it's clear that love continuously on an ongoing basis drives out fear particularly any fear of God's punishment or God's disapproval or God's anger. God doesn't want us to stand back from him, away from him in fear, particularly when we need him most. Yeah. What he desires from us, David Benner has this wonderful phrase for it, reverential intimacy. Yes. That means, yes, we will be, we will be reverent. We'll stand in reverent, adoring awe of the one who is holy. But that same holy God wants us close enough to hear his heartbeat, 
Yep. He wants us to look into his eyes. He wants to look into our eyes. Yeah. And be able to be in relationship with one another. Right. He wants us to look into his eyes so we can re can see who God really is. So we can see what God's love is really like and what God really wants in relationship with us. Because it's only in experiencing that love that we are able to be freed to move courageously toward God rather than away from him. Oh, so I, I use the word courageously. So how does that courage happen? Well, paradoxically, it happens through surrender, which doesn't seem to go together in the ways that we usually understand these words. But when it, when it comes to God, see, it's only when we experience for ourselves the safety of God's unconditional, inconceivably gracious love, that we can let go of our fear and we can vulnerably receive. All right, so I said the word surrender. And um, Tony and I often teach about words like submission and surrender and subjection and in some of our classes. But this word surrender doesn't usually bring up positive um, responses or... So how did you respond when I said the word surrender? You may have responded like most people do with some resistance, with images in your mind of, of waving a white flag. You may have responded with some feelings of being overpowered or subdued or memories of being shamed. Maybe thoughts rose up of having to show some kind of outward compliance or dutiful obedience to someone who forced your surrender. But listen very closely. Although humans have treated each other this way, and bad theology has taught us that this is the surrender that God expects from us, that understanding of surrender is not authentic Christian surrender at all. Surrendering to God's love is not bondage, it's freedom. It's freedom from fear, from guilt, from the exhaustion of having to earn everything in your own strength because you can't trust not only God, but you can't trust anyone else. See, surrendering to God's love is not groveling. It's grace. It's the gracious freedom to receive what you're longing for, to receive love and rest and the peace of letting God do what only God can do. So, don't just take our word for it. Let's look at a biblical story that illustrates this kind of surrender. That what can happen in everyday life, and especially in moments of real stress, like we're experiencing now. And the story, by the way, just happens to involve a boat that's struggling to float. It's from Mark chapter 6. It's mm -hmm. from the message version. So, we're going to read it with you, and then we'll talk as we go a little bit. As soon as the meal was finished, I'll get to that in a moment, Jesus insisted that the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead across to Bethsaida while he dismissed the congregation, the people. After sending them off, he climbed the mountain to pray. Late at night, the boat was far out at sea. Jesus was still by himself on land. He could see his men struggling with the oars, the wind having come up against them. Now, this, this story is occurring right after Jesus taught and fed thousands of people. And that's on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, this, this feeding of the 5,000 or however many it was beyond the 5,000 men there. And the, the disciples, they hop on a boat. They go to the opposite shore of the, of the Sea of Galilee, which is not that far away. I was actually there this past summer. And you can see from one side to the other. There's a picture I took. Uh, and you can actually see a boat out there on the sea. And he was probably, Jesus was probably on one of those hills on the other side. We were at the corner of the Sea of Galilee. And the, the disciples would have been headed this way toward, toward where I was standing. And I wouldn't have wanted to row across it, but it's, it's not terribly far. It's just a couple of miles. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus didn't go with him. He spent the night in reverential intimacy with his father. Yeah. And he watched them up there from his hillside. And he saw the storm come through, as storms are one to do on this sea. He saw the wind whip up. He watched them wearing themselves out in the effort to row against it. It should have been long ago 
This was the next morning. They still haven't made it across a couple miles of sea. They were exhausting themselves in the struggle to do this. Mm -hmm. And this is the same way he watches over you and me. Yeah. I see you, he says. Yeah. I am watching. Don't be afraid of that, by the way. I know what you're going through. Yeah. I see the wind you're fighting against. I see your efforts and your struggles. I know your fatigue and your fear. Mm -hmm. And best of all, he says that to us of utter compassion. It's not shame. It's not anger. It's not frustration. It's not you got to whip yourself into shape. It's compassion. Yeah. And it gets even better because he doesn't just sympathize from a distance. He steps in just like he did for the disciples there that night. At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the sea. Now, this, this version says he intended to go right by them. This is a mistranslation, by the way. Yeah. That last phrase in Greek that he intended actually means either to pass by or to come to. And it's obvious from the previous sentence that Jesus was coming to them. Yeah. He was not merely out for a stroll across the sea in the middle of a storm at 4 a.m. Yeah, that, 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 that doesn't make sense. He came to them in their distress which is, if you think about it, is the whole point of his incarnation. God came to us to be with us in our lives, in our distress, in our confusion, in our fears. Now, the question is, is that how you see God? Right. How do you imagine God? How do you imagine God acting in your life, particularly in your moments of distress? And there's a couple options, and people do all three of them. So maybe for, for you, God is far away in heaven, and he's, he's looking down at you from afar, but not emotionally or otherwise involved, just, just watching mm -hmm. from a distance. God is watching. There was an old song about that. Whereas God may be close by, but maybe standing in the corner of a room, watching what you're doing, maybe even feeling, you know, sympathizing with you a bit, but, but not acting, not getting involved. Mm-hmm. Or, or is God walking to you, coming to you on water if necessary, in order to join you, be with you in your distress? How do you imagine God? Yeah. Well, the next verse shows us that that last option, the third option, is what Jesus chose in that moment with his disciples. Even though it caused his disciples a bit more distress to see him coming at them, on the waves, a little bit more distressed before things got better. But the scripture, the scripture account goes on, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and screamed, scared out of their wits. So a little more distress there. But see, they weren't reacting any differently than we would have, right? We're all in the same boat, and I don't mean to make a pun, that's kind of Tony's thing. <laughs> Uh, thing to do. But we are all in the same boat at this point. Um, um, here they are in the dark, in a fierce storm, waves crashing, they're rowing and getting nowhere, and then they dimly see a figure walking towards them on the water. <laughs> As if the situation wasn't scary enough, here comes something else to be afraid of. And they were really, really afraid. They were so afraid that the text uses the word petrified to describe them. And I think it's fair to say that if we had been there, we'd have been petrified too. It took them a moment, right, to understand that what at first appeared to be a threat was actually their closest friend who, yes, was still doing something scary, but doing it in a marvelous, miraculous way. And look at how Jesus responds to them. It says, Jesus was quick to comfort them. Courage, it's me, don't be afraid. Well, don't be afraid. I think we all know that that's one of the most repeated phrases in the Bible. Whenever something unexplainable happens, uh, the usual first human reaction is fear. And God's usual first response to that fear is, don't be afraid. But see, this verse offers us a bit more. It's revealing something about the motivation behind the words that 
Jesus was quick to comfort them. Jesus wanted to comfort them. Jesus loved them. Jesus wanted to calm their fears, to show them that, that look, all is well. Yeah, the storm's still raging, but it all is well simply because I'm with you. And Jesus is also very clear here who he is, who it is that's with, with them. He says, look, who, I'm, I'm with you. It's me. But you know, literally, again, in the original text, what he says is, I am. Courage, don't be afraid. I am. And you know, none of the disciples would have missed Jesus' reference there. Jesus was referencing the question that Moses asked God at the burning bush. You know, uh, God says, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt, and I want you to be the one I'll use to deliver the, the Hebrew slaves. And Moses, oh yeah, we'll talk about fear. Moses was afraid. And he said, well, okay, so when I get there, when the Hebrew slaves ask me the name of the God who sent me, what should I say? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. All right, back to the boat. The wind is still raging at this point. The waves are still crashing. And Jesus says, oh, by the way, the one who sent Moses to your to free your ancestors and part the waters before them is standing in front of you on this water right now. It's pro it is, this is powerful. He's saying, I'm the compassionate God who revealed himself to Moses. I'm the one who's seen you in your exhaustion and your bondage. I've seen you trying to make bricks out of straw. And I want you to be free. I want you to be whole. In another place, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. He's saying, my heart is open. My heart is tender with love for you. Let that penetrate your petrified heart. And you know what? Oh my, really? When that reality does penetrate our frightened hearts, the reality that in Christ, that God is always with us. That God is always loving us. That same God who brought slaves out of bondage and parted the waters to do it, that God is always wanting to comfort and free and heal us too right in the midst of whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. See, and when we actually, when that starts to penetrate our closed hearts of stone, oh my gosh, they can really begin slowly, but they can begin to open, to maybe trust love again. And how does that happen? Well, Jesus tells us, again, there's a lot packed into that one verse. Jesus says, how does that happen? Courage. I'm seeing the cowardly lion in my mind right now from the Wizard of Oz. Courage. But you know what's so cool here is that Jesus uses a word that means be comforted, be emboldened, to have courage. See, he's not saying, look, I'm seeing, you know, you need to do this for yourself. He's not saying that. Be comforted, be emboldened to have courage. courage. This is a word that refers to God's work of bolstering and comforting us with his good courage. See, Jesus isn't saying to them, get with it, guys, be bold, be strong, be daring in your own power. No, he is inviting them to trust God to provide what they need as they continue to allow themselves to be empowered and supported by him.
moment by moment by moment. Jesus shows them that courage is not always taking hold of a situation with loud, powerful action. It can be that, but here in this situation, he's showing them that courage can also be quiet abiding trust that stands unmoving like a mountain held by the earth beneath it, or like a boat held securely by the water beneath it, even when that water is raging. Just like it was for the yeah. disciples in that story, just like it is for us. Mm -hmm. The story continues. Soon as he, Jesus, had climbed into the boat, the wind died down. They were stunned, shaking their heads, wondering what was going on. They couldn't comprehend in their minds anything that was happening to them. How is Jesus walking on water? Why is he even there with them? Did we leave him up on the mountain? And how did that wind die down all of a sudden? This was still early in their following of him. And though they had seen some pretty marvelous things already, they had not seen this. And they were totally kerfluffled. Mm -hmm. Well, to live with courage means abandoning our need for and efforts to understand and comprehend and much less control and to risk trusting in God's love. Yeah. To relax our tight grip on our lives and on other people and the circumstances around us. To let go of our self-reliance and our understanding. To trust in ways that we cannot yet imagine. Mm -hmm. To trust that we will not fall and we will not sink. We will not be lost in the storm. Yes. Instead, we will float, just like this boat was floating. Right. And there in the early morning hours, and the wind had died down, there was stillness. And there was peace. And with Jesus in the boat with them, there was reverential intimacy. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Their boat, our boat, simply rests on the quiet water. And that water is the power of God's love to hold us. Yeah. The point of the story, by the way, is not that the wind died down, but uh, strong winds would blow again on every sea, in every life. The point was not what was happening to them, around them. The point was who was with them. Yes. And in that moment, Jesus was showing them who God really is. Mm -hmm. And in this moment, April 5th, 2020, in our own storm, he's showing us the same thing. And the question is, will we take the risk to trust that it is really true? Yeah. Taking the risk to trust in God's love. That's what courage is. And by the way, it need not be a perfect courage. We don't get perfect courage overnight, if ever. And, and if, our per, if our courage is imperfect, it doesn't take God by surprise. And the disciples didn't have it. Mm -hmm. Just the day before, they had watched him feed thousands of people with a couple of fishes and some loaves of bread. They had seen it with their own eyes. They were amazed at the miracle, but the point of it had not yet sunk in in a way that had given them the, the, the courage for the storm. Yeah. The passage concludes with this. They didn't understand what he had done at the supper. None of this had yet penetrated their hearts. Mm -hmm. And that last phrase, again, the original language is really helpful here, literally means that their hearts had been petrified. We keep using that word. <laughs> They had been petrified with fear in the boats because their hearts had already been petrified by life. Long before they began following Jesus, not afraid all the time, but hardened, changed into a stony substance. Long before they began following Jesus. Yeah. They were unwilling to let go of trusting themselves in order to grab hold of the only one who is completely trustworthy. So here was an opportunity to open up their hearts. Their minds may not comprehend, but their hearts could open up to take this experience deep into their very souls and to live at least a bit differently, a bit more courageously. And of course, it's the same with us. We too, all of us have experienced some petrification of our hearts. It's part of what Joanne was talking about earlier. Life has taught us to be afraid, to harden, to protect ourselves, which is why we are sometimes petrified by life in the sense that we're afraid. Yeah. And this current crisis is just this wonderful invitation yep. to look back over, uh, over our lives with God, to see that God has always been with us in the boat, in all of it, loving us through it all. Yes. 
And the phrase for that is our, our graced history. We can look back and see the grace. We can connect the dots maybe differently than our petrified heart would have allowed us to do so before. And that, that graced history gives us the courage to risk trusting that with him we can also live into a graced future. Yeah. There is nothing ahead of us that is any different than what God has brought us through already. Right. And so he's asking a lot. He's offering a lot. He's asking a lot. It's a big risk. But, you know, he wasn't asking them or us to do something that he wasn't willing to do himself. Jesus' life is our example as Christians of what a willing heart and life looks like, our example to follow. And so when he was, his disciples asked him one day, you know, how, how do we pray? How, teach us how to pray. Jesus showed them. He showed his disciples by praying himself. He always demonstrates it first. He models whatever he's trying to teach us. He does it first. So he prayed himself, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And see, it was more than words for Jesus. In every choice and action, Jesus chose what the Father wanted. Today's Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Holy Week. It's a time when we remember how Jesus courageously surrendered his earthly life to his Father's love. He publicly wept in compassion over Jerusalem as, as he rode a donkey into the city. His vulnerable heart was painfully longing for those who had no clue who he was or what he was about to do for them. And then at the end of the week, in Gethsemane, Jesus prayed in anguish. He wanted to be released from the pain of what await, awaited him, the crucifixion and death. He struggled mightily in the garden that night. He did it first for us. He understands because he's been there. But you know, in somewhere in that struggle, and it was intense, but somewhere, somewhere in there, Jesus chose to risk again, saying yes to God. Jesus chose to risk letting go and entrusting himself again to God's care. He'd been doing it all of his earthly existence. But he chose again that night to let go and trust in God's love, even as the soldiers came to arrest him, even as a friend betrayed him with a kiss, even as most of his other friends abandoned him, even as he was tried and tortured and nailed to a cross, even as he felt all the suffering that humanity had or would ever feel. Even with his last breath, Jesus was surrendered to love. Into your hands I commit my spirit, he cried out at the very end. It's a prayer that was said by Jews of Jesus' time every day. They said it as part of their evening prayer. These were the last words on their lips before they closed their eyes and surrendered to sleep. These were the words that led them into peace and into rest and into the darkness with hope that God would raise them to life again the next morning. The crowd hearing these words at the foot of Jesus' cross must have been confused. They knew what he was saying. They knew what he was praying. But these weren't the words of a dying criminal. These were not the words of a blasphemer who's getting what he deserves. These are, these are the words of a trusting child just before closing his eyes in the sleep of death. In complete trust, Jesus surrendered himself into his father's hands. And you know, the crowd may not have understood, but as we stand at the foot of that cross, as we watch him gasping for air to speak these last few words, we can begin 
we can begin to see the amazing gift of courage that he's offering us. We don't have courage really, but he does. He assures us that no matter how deep the darkness grows, no matter how much pain and suffering we endure in this life, no matter how misunderstood or mistreated we may be, no matter how hopeless circumstances may appear, fear does not get the final word. Despair does not get the final word. Even death does not get the final word. Because we have the choice today and every day about where we are going to willingly entrust our lives and our hearts. Yeah, we can continue to trust only in ourselves and live fear-driven lives from petrified hearts. Or we can risk opening our hearts to Christ. We can risk letting the, our hearts be penetrated by his comfort and filled with his compassion and held in the power of his love. Again, we're quoting a lot from David Benner, but he writes, we are surrendering ourselves to God's unconditional and perfect love. In that perfect love, we should relax and find rest. Surrender involves relaxing, relaxing and letting go. It is floating in the river that is made of God's love. Floating is surrendering. See, there are times when God does ask us to step forward in courage to do what we can do. But there are also times, like the days we are now living in, when we've done all that we can do and God asks us to step back so he can step in and do what only he can do. That's what Jesus did at the cross. It's finished, he cried out. And in that moment, his great heart physically broke open as he surrendered. He floated into the, the rest of, of God's perfect love, trusting that a new day would dawn and he would be alive to greet it. Let's close our eyes for a moment, wherever you are, whoever you're with. Let's just take a moment and close our eyes. And would you allow the Holy Spirit to use the godly imagination that you were given? And allow yourself to be in the boat in the midst of the storm with the other disciples. Just take a moment, let yourself be there. And you know, there's a, a form of prayer called the prayer of the application of the senses. It allows us to experience the stories of scripture in a way that they are not only in our head, which is a good place we need to know about them, but this application of the senses prayer allows us to experience the living word as if we were there, because in a sense, we're in Christ, and we were, and we are. So apply your senses. Let yourself see the waves crashing all around the boat, the water splashing on you. Taste the salt on your lips. Hear the wind howling and the oars creaking under the weight of the water. Let yourself Feel the exhaustion in your body and the fear in your heart. And then in the murky darkness, you see someone walking towards you through the raging storm. Yeah, feel the adrenaline rush. Your heart's pounding with even more fear now until you recognize who it is your dearest friend, it's Jesus. He comes to the side of the boat and he gets in and he sits next to you. 
And wow, the storm is calmed and it's quiet. It's just you and Jesus now. And his eyes are full of tender compassion for you. Yeah, wordlessly. You know that he's wanting you to risk surrendering to his love. What does that mean for you? What could that look like in your life? Is there something that you need to let go of in order to relax and float in his love? And are you willing to receive from him the courage you need to open your heart and receive what only he can give you? We're gonna pause for a moment here just at, as you pray and, and feel free at this point too, especially if, if you're by yourself, just feel free to pause the recording and just stay with this prayer, stay with Jesus. Show him your heart and let him give you his surrender. Or you can come back to this prayer again and again during this Holy Week. So we'll pause for a moment and then Tony's gonna close us. As swimmers dare to lie face to the sky and water bears them. As hawks rest upon the air and air sustains them. So would I learn to attain freefall and float into creator spirit's deep embrace. Knowing no effort earns that all surrounding grace. Yes. There's a prayer for you. We'll yes. post that poem. So, how are you floating? Yeah. Are you more peaceful in your sea, maybe, as a result of our time together and our time with God? Or perhaps you might want to continue your conversation with Jesus about that. No matter what we're feeling, Christ is with us. It's not a matter of our feeling. Even if you're not feeling it, you don't have any courage, and you don't think everything's going to be okay, <laughs> he is still with you in the boat. Yes. And he will never leave. Yes. So here's a prayer that we'll conclude with that expresses whatever courage we have <laughs> today. And Joanne and I will read the leader parts, and we're going to invite you to do what we did last week. You respond with the all parts wherever you are. We won't be able to hear you, but God will. And uh, you say this, this out loud um, to the degree that you can, and God knows what you can do, even if the courage is imperfect and the, uh, the prayer is imperfect today. Lord, you have always given bread for the coming day. And though I feel poor, today I trust. Lord, you've always given strength for the coming day. And though I feel weak, today I trust. And Lord, you have always given peace for the coming day. And though anxious of heart, today I trust. Lord, you've always held us in love through trials. And now, tried as I am, today I trust. Lord, you have always marked the road for the coming day. And though it may, though be, it may be hidden, today, today I, believe I believe and trust. Lord, you've always lightened this darkness. And those shadows surround me, today I trust. Lord, you have always spoken when time was ripe. And even if you seem silent now, today I trust. Amen. Amen. We'll be praying for all of you during this Holy Week. 
and um, we'll be praying for the, the kind of surrender that Jesus modeled for us to become not only the example for us, but actually the, the lived response of our lives. Bless you all. Look for announcements about what next weekend will contain. Yeah, blessings on you. Grace, peace, courage. Amen. Bye-bye.